Hello everyone, the age of the universe is 13.8 billion years. And how do we know that? And for that matter, how do we actually calculate the age of the universe? This is what we are talking about today. Plus an emergent disagreement between theory and measurement that has led us to a crisis in cosmology. So let's start. The age of the universe constitutes a time period from the Big Bang to the current moment of time. So it should seem obvious that to calculate the age of the universe, we need something that will allow us to infer when the Big Bang happened. Something like the expansion of the universe. As the universe started expanding when the Big Bang happened. So here it is. As the universe is expanding from the beginning of the universe, we can use the expansion of the universe to calculate the age of the universe. But first, how do we actually know the universe is expanding in the first place? Well, here's a short answer. From as long as 1912 when Vestus Lifer first observed a red shift in galaxies, which we will talk about later, the vision of a static universe, universe neither expanding or contracting, was getting challenged. In 1915, when Einstein published his general theory of relativity and applied it to the universe as a whole, he got a universe that should not be static. But Einstein was sure that the universe must be static. So he included another term in the equations of general relativity that allowed the universe to be static. This is known as the cosmological constant. Later in the next decade, Alexander Friedman correctly found a solution of general relativity that implied the universe must be either expanding or contracting or static. Later, observations by Edwin Hubble of the distances to different galaxies and observations by Westerslifer of the redshift of these galaxies allowed Edwin Hubble to discover that nearly all of the galaxies are moving away from us. And the further away a galaxy is, the faster it seems to be moving away from us. The universe is expanding. So basically, the idea is that if we can know what the rate of the expansion of the universe is today, we can use the physics backwards and extrapolate how the universe would have been expanding in the past and get the time when the expansion of the universe has just started off the Big Bang and this will tell us what the age of the universe is the rate of expansion of the universe is known as the Hubble constant of the universe now there are currently loads of ways by which you can measure the Hubble constant i.e. the rate of expansion of the universe but the thing is that these methods don't agree with each other well slightly the two main ways by which we can measure the Hubble constant of the universe is first by using the cosmic distance ladder method and second by studying the earliest light of the universe, the cosmic microwave background radiation. Cosmic distance ladder method. The universe is expanding and because of that, distant galaxies appear to be moving away from us. Now if we can know how far these galaxies are and how fast these galaxies are moving away from us, we can calculate what the Hubble constant of the universe should be. How fast these galaxies are moving away from us can be calculated using the redshift of light that was emitted from the galaxies towards us. Redshift is the shift of the wavelength of the light towards the red end of the spectrum. This happens because of the expansion of the universe which stretches the wavelength of the light making it more redder. So the precise amount by which the light from those galaxies are getting redshifted can tell us how fast these galaxies are moving away from us. This is similar to Doppler shift of sound. But to calculate the Hubble constant of the universe, in addition to the receding velocities, we also need distances to those galaxies. Now calculating distances to far away galaxies is far harder than calculating redshift of these galaxies. To calculate distances to far away galaxies, we use the galaxies to which we know the distances to and then use them to calculate distances to far away galaxies. Hence cosmic distance ladder. First to calculate distances to nearby stars, we use astronomers bread and butter method, the parallax method. Many of you would be familiar to this method. It is similar to when we see an object close to us with one eye and then from the other eye, the apparent position of the object seems to be moved. So if we know the distance between the two measuring points, in this case our eyes, and the angle it makes with the eyes, we can calculate the distance to that object using basic trigonometry. Parallax method, however, can't be used to calculate distances to far away stars and galaxies. So to calculate distances to far away stars and galaxies, we do something like this. We use the parallax method to calculate distances to some special type of light source that are near to us and those that are found in almost every galaxy and whose actual brightness can be known. These are known as standard candles. For example, there are stars known as Cepheid variables. The special thing about these stars is that their pulsating period is highly correlated with their actual brightness. To know in what way they are correlated, we can use the parallax method to calculate distances to some nearby Cepheids. And then by observing their pulsating period, we can formulate a relationship between distance and pulsating period. 
and as Cepheid variable stars are the same everywhere, we can apply this relationship to faraway Cepheid variable stars as well. So by observing the pulsating period of a faraway Cepheid variable star, we can get its true brightness and by comparing it to its apparent brightness from Earth, we can get the distance of that Cepheid variable star. And if the Cepheid variable star happens to be in a different galaxy, we also get the distance to that galaxy as well. These characteristics of Cepheid variable stars were first discovered by Henrietta Swan Leavitt in 1908. Now Cepheid variable stars are great, but they are just not so good in determining the distance to galaxies that are too far away, as Cepheid variable stars are the stars, they aren't too bright. Another kind of standard candle is a type 1a supernova. It's a kind of supernova observed in a binary system of stars. In this binary system, one of the stars is a white dwarf. A white dwarf is a stellar remnant of a dead star with a mass of less than 8 solar masses. What this means is that a star with a mass of less than 8 solar masses will become a white dwarf after the star dies. Now, in a white dwarf, there is no nuclear fusion happening. It supports its weight using electron degeneracy pressure. To know more about this, check out my earlier video. Now, when the partner star of the white dwarf approaches the end of his life, it starts to expand. Then the gravity from the white dwarf starts taking in mass from the partner star. Once the white dwarf crosses the mass of 1.4 solar masses, electron degeneracy pressure cannot support the weight of the star, and the white dwarf goes supernova, an implosion of the core of the star. And since the mass limit of 1.4 solar mass is the same for every white dwarf, the actual brightness of the supernova is predictable. And by observing its apparent brightness from Earth, we can get the uh, distance of the supernova, same way we get the distance to Cepheid variable stars. But unlike Cepheid variable stars, supernovas are extremely bright. They can outshine their entire galaxy. So this will allow us to calculate distance of very far away objects. But if you think about that, I haven't actually told you how do we actually calculate the Hubble constant of the universe using redshift and distances to galaxies. So let's delve into it. Once we have figured out the distances to galaxies and their receding velocities using redshift, what we found was that the receding velocity of the galaxies is proportional to their distance from us. The further away a galaxy is, the faster it seems to be moving away from us. When we plot the graph of the receding velocity and the distance of many galaxies and then draw the line of best fit, the slope of the line is the Hubble constant. Now, if you pay attention to the unit of the Hubble constant, you will find that it has unit of kilometers per second per megaparsec. A megaparsec is also a measure of distance. It is approximately equal to 3.26 million light years. Now, if you pay a little more attention, you will find that if you manipulate this in the right way, it has units of inverse time. And let me tell you, the time we get from this is none other than the time elapsed from the Big Bang or in other words, the age of the universe. At least approximately because it assumes the Hubble constant of the universe has not changed at all. But we know that the Hubble constant had been large in the past and a couple of billion years ago it has started accelerating again. So in reality, the age of the universe we get is actually less than what we'll get by believing the Hubble constant has not changed at all. Now, after careful analysis of thousands of galaxies using supernova measurements, the value of the Hubble constant we get from this method is 73.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec. What this really means? It means that every one megaparsec distance away, the expansion rate is 73.5 kilometers per second faster. And the age of the universe we get from this value of the Hubble constant is 13.2 billion years. I know this is not the 13.8 billion years we all are familiar with, but to understand this, we need to understand another method we use to calculate the Hubble constant of the universe. See, when we look out in outer space, we receive a faint radiation coming from every direction in the microwave range of the electromagnetic spectrum. This is the cosmic microwave background. It was released at the time of recombination, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Before this time, the universe was not cold enough for neutral atoms to form, and because of that, light was just scattering around in the plasma of electrons and protons. The universe was basically opaque. But when the universe cooled enough for electron protons to join together and form neutral atoms, light for the first time can move free in the universe without bumping into so many particles. Universe for the first time became transparent. So this is the story of the afterglow of the Big Bang. This was the radiation which we were receiving from every direction. Now to the key point. The temperature of this radiation is almost the same everywhere, but not exactly the same. The average temperature of this radiation is about 2.725 Kelvin. But some spots are tiny bit colder and some are tiny bit hotter. These fluctuations in the temperature of the CMB allows us to predict the composition of the universe at that time. 
there's something called a power spectrum which is kind of a graph of the temperature and entropies of the CMB. The peaks of this graph have interesting features. The first peak of this graph contains information about the curvature of the universe. The second peak contains information about the baryon density. And the third peak contains information about the dark matter density. So what I mean to say is that using CMB we can get the information about the composition of the universe. It is believed that the universe contains 5% regular baryonic matter, 27% dark matter and 68% dark energy which is causing the expansion rate of the universe to accelerate. So there is a clear connection between the composition of the universe and the expansion rate of the universe. For example, if there would have been more dark matter in the universe, the expansion rate would have been lesser as gravity tries to resist the expansion of the universe. And if there would have been more dark energy in the universe, the expansion rate would have been larger. So what we now need is a model, a model for the evolution of the universe as a whole. And in the model, we will put the predicted values of the composition of the universe. Like for example, how much dark matter or dark energy is in the universe. And then using the theory, we can predict given these components of the universe, how the Hubble constant of the universe would have changed over time. And by extension, the current value for the Hubble constant of the universe. But any model we come up with has to explain what we already see in the universe. Like for example, the cosmic microwave background radiation or the fact that the universe is expanding or the distribution of galaxies in the universe or the observed abundance of hydrogen and helium and so on. Now the currently accepted model for the evolution of the universe is the Lambda CDM model, which is sometimes referred to as the standard model of cosmology. In short, what we really do is that we use the CMB data to come up with the values of the physical constituents of the universe then we apply these values to the currently accepted model for the evolution of the universe which then allows us to predict how the Hubble constant would have changed over time and by extension what the current value of the Hubble constant should be. Now the value of the Hubble constant which we have found using this method is 67.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec and the corresponding age of the universe which we get from this Hubble constant is 13.8 billion years. Now there are currently many other ways by which we can measure the Hubble constant of the universe like gravitational waves, gravitational lensing or baryonic acoustic oscillations. But the thing is that any method that takes into account data from the late modern universe gives us a Hubble constant that is about 73 km per second per megaparsec. And any method that takes into account data from the early universe, data from the CMB, gives us a Hubble constant that is around 67 km per second per megaparsec. And this is what's been said to be the crisis in cosmology, that the rate of expansion of the universe we measure through a model using CMB does not match with the rate of expansion we measure directly in the late universe using standard candles. So what can be the reason behind all of this? Well, there are a couple of things that could potentially be the reason of this anomaly. Maybe there's something wrong with the data, or the model may not be correct after all. Or maybe there can be things in the universe which we have not taken into account, or maybe something else entirely. Currently, we are pretty sure that the age of the universe is 13.8 billion years or very close to 13.8 billion years because we have a tremendous amount of data to back it up. But don't be surprised if someday we come up with an age of the universe which have a number very close to but not quite exactly 13.8 billion years. Recently, data from the Dark Energy Survey has also been released and it also hints towards an anomaly. See, using CMB data taken by Planck satellite, we can use the Lambda CDM model to predict what the distribution of matter in the universe should be like. Now, the dark energy survey data suggests that the dark matter in the universe is a little bit less clumpier than what was predicted using the Lambda CDM model. But currently, the difference is not enough that it can't be explained using standard fluctuations in the data. Yes, the uncertainties in both the models does not overlap now, but still, the difference is not enough. I will suggest this video by Dr. Beck if you want to know more about dark energy survey. Thanks for watching. If you have something to ask, you should ask in the comments. Uh, thanks for watching again and bye. See you next time.